So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we all know how hard it is to keep our data lakes optimized, especially if we need to be able to mutate the data. But it doesn't have to be. Uh, we're super excited to physically stand uh, on this stage after more than uh, two years. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, the road to a robust data lake, or how Nexar is using Delta Lake and Databricks to map 150 million miles of roads every month. Oh, wait, it's already 180 since we created the abstract for this talk. Um, my name is Ophir Kerker. I am a data platform tech lead at Nexar and a former CTO uh, at Kapai. Uh, with me today is Itai Yaffe, a senior solution architect at Databricks, and today is Itai's uh, first anniversary at Databricks. Um, previously, Itai worked. Yeah. Previously, Itai worked at Imply and uh, was a big data tech lead uh, at Nielsen. Woo. So, what will you learn uh, today, or what's in it for you? Uh, we will be discussing some use cases from Nexar uh, of how to efficiently process data in a streaming fashion, uh, support data mutability, and keep your data lake optimized by utilizing Delta Lake and Databricks. But first, uh, a quick intro to Nexar. Uh, Nexar was founded in uh, 2015 uh, with the moonshot mission of building the air traffic control system of the road. Uh, basically, to build a data layer connecting vehicles, uh, drivers, uh, city infrastructure, uh, to promote road safety, prevent car accidents, and also improve road utilization. Nexar turns cars into vision sensors or road crawlers, if you would like, uh, to continuously capture and understand uh, the world surrounding us, uh, and build the, the first digital twin of the physical world. Uh, that's a virtual representation of the world which is updated in real time. So um, we have over 430,000 active Nexar powered uh, dash cams on the road, which capture videos and imagery of, uh, as I said, 180 million miles every month. Um, over the years, we've been able to collect an enormous data set of 4 trillion images all over the world. Our consumers, um, which use our dash cams, um, enjoy an intelligent, intelligent dash cam, which not only record and back up their rides, but also assist them to drive safely. Our B2B customers, uh, which are also our data customers, um, are uh, autonomous vehicles companies, cities, and transportation agencies. Uh, mapping providers, large fleets, automotive OEMs, and insurance companies. So Nexar uses crowdsourced vision to turn images into meaningful insights. Uh, a few of our customers only require fresh and recent images uh, of the road, but most customers use Nexar's city stream to get insights built from many computer vision and deep learning detections and large-scale distributed uh, clustering algorithms. Having many eyes on the road allows us also to detect uh, changes in road furniture and conditions, uh, which, for example, helps cities prioritize road maintenance uh, or alert autonomous vehicles companies to reroute their cars away from dangerous scenarios. We are a spatial data company um, but where privacy comes first, and we invest heavily not only in keeping our users safe, but also their personal information safe. We are using AI to remove uh, any potential personal information. We automatically uh, blur license plates and faces around the car, and we crop the car's dashboard from imagery uh, to prevent exposing any PII. Um, we will never share routes or personal footage, and we are GDPR and CCPA compliant. So before we dive into some of uh, the use cases that uh, we prepared for you, I would like to first set some context. Uh, so here's Nexar's platform's high-level architecture. Um, so video and sensor data is flowing from the camera into Nexar's mobile app. And then one frame per second videos, which we uh, also call time-lapse videos, uh, incident video clips, uh, interesting frames, and signals like GPS, accelerometer, or gyroscope are uploaded asynchronously to Nexar's cloud. There, this data is stored and available uh, to our uh, consumers and can be sent to the insurance provider in case of an incident uh, if they opt in. Uh, this data is also anonymized, ingested, and indexed uh, for our data customers. So let's zoom uh, in uh, on this part of the system. Uh, so Nexar, Nexar's backend receives and ingests billions of signals from virus sensors, uh, millions of video files and images, 
which are sent to our S3 bucket on AWS. Uh, some data like detections and evidence is sent to our mobile edge compute clusters uh, for low latency workloads like real-time road blockage detection. Uh, this data is going through multiple pipelines of enrichment uh, and transformations like uh, running deep learning models uh, uh, or improved localization accuracy, which we will see soon in our talk. Uh, then the enriched data, which includes detections and other anonymized data, is aggregated and indexed to build our products for our data customers. We use Delta Lake as our data lake and some legacy data which is stored as ORC files which can be accessed uh, using Presto or Hive. For serving the data, we, uh, we use uh, Elasticsearch, Postgres, and SilaDB, uh, which is a drop-in replacement for Cassandra and provides low and consistent latency. Our data can be consumed via um, GIS systems, APIs, and live feeds. So let's dive into one of the enrichment pipelines we have in Nexar, uh, which improves the location accuracy reported by the GPS sensor. Uh, so during every ride, the Nexar app collects GPS signals and some other signals into compressed files. Uh, these files are uploaded directly to an uh, AWS S3 bucket into a specific ride prefix. Uh, the uploaded data uh, build up a massive amount of small files. Uh, each signals file independently uh, goes through a pipeline of transformations and enrichments. Uh, for example, map matching. So in, in this enrichment pipeline, we improve the GPS accuracy by predicting the dash cam's location uh, using a trail of noisy GPS uh, coordinates and the prior knowledge of the road network. As you can see here, uh, this is, I think, North San Francisco. Um, so uh, map matching and other data transformations are straightforward to be performed in small chunks. Uh, however, querying data when it spans on millions of small files using any SQL engine um, is not practical, uh, even if it's converted into columnar formats like Parquet or ORC. Uh, queries can run extremely slowly, and, and the cost of compute as well as uh, uh, S3 API calls become excessively high. So in order to keep our data lake optimized, we need to compact a stream of small files. Um, and other challenges with stream processing uh, may include uh, continuous updating the imagery coverage across roads, uh, aggregate the previous day's events uh, from the data lake, taking into account uh, late arriving data. And in general, how can we efficiently process files in a streaming fashion? So it wasn't an easy problem to solve in the past few years. Um, let's uh, go down the memory lane and see how other companies try to tackle it. Itai, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, back in 2019, the last uh, Spark and I Summit, I think, uh, before COVID hit. So I actually um, shared the story about how uh, we at Nielsen Marketing Cloud, which was the division I work uh, back then, uh, build a proprietary data infrastructure in order to mitigate those uh, challenges that Ophir mentioned. And just to give you a very uh, high-level context, so Nielsen is a data measurement company, and Nielsen uh, Marketing Cloud is a business unit within that uh, company that collects anonymous device-level data from various sources, and then uh, that data, which is over uh, five petabytes in total, is used for uh, measurement and targeting purposes. Now, before diving into the exact solution, let's review the data processing methods that we had uh, available for us, or in general, back then. So, there were three methods. Uh, there was stream processing into a data lake, batch processing from a data lake, and stream processing over a data lake. Now, stream processing into a data lake is rather straightforward. We have the raw uh, data coming in, usually in shape of messages from message buses like Kafka. We can process it using uh, things like uh, Spark structured streaming, and then we write the process files uh, into uh, your choice of data lake on cloud storage, be it AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. Now, most or, or many of those consumers uh, of the data are stateless applications, just read the raw data and write it almost as is, just in the shape of uh, files, into a location uh, in your data lake. So it can be, for example, row and then partition by date. However, uh, other uh, type of consumers are uh, stateful applications that are usually uh, built for analytics purposes. And then we can have dozens or more of them that read the same raw data uh, massage the data and process it and aggregate it, and then write it into a different location in the data lake, uh, for example, aggregated and then partitioned by the date. 
Now, this is a very good approach because it allows you to serve fresher data and make more informed business decisions. However, the additional, uh, what I call the stateful consumers, can increase your operational uh, costs. A, because they uh, read uh, or consume right optimized data, for example, AVO messages for message buses. They then uh, can put additional burden on the source system, such as Kafka. And also, you, use, you usually use 24-7 streaming job uh, clusters, so you pay for them even if they're idle or underutilized. Now, batch processing from a data lake is also probably straightforward. So you take those uh, files that were uh, earlier written to your data lake, and then periodically, let's say once a day, you run a Spark batch job that read an entire folder by date. So today we are on June 28th. So we'll read June 27th entire folder, uh, process it using Spark batch, and then write it to the aggregated location for that day. Now, uh, as opposed to streaming into a data lake, it actually reduces the operational cost because now we uh, consume read-optimized data, for example, parquet files from infinite scale cloud storage, and you can periodically launch transient job clusters uh, that are terminated as soon as they finish the processing part, and then you don't pay for them. However, it's a very uh, a big challenge to uh, know when to run those processes or essentially when all the raw data has arrived to the destination folder because remember, we're talking uh, about destination folder by date. And then we start asking ourselves, okay, how much time should we wait, right, for all the data uh, for the past date to arrive? And there's actually a very good virtual talk in this summit by my ex-colleague from Nielsen, uh, Simona Miriam, where she talks about the is it the end of the day uh, question. Uh, but uh, going back to our presentation, so if we, uh, if, we don't linked, uh, if we don't wait long enough, we'll miss late arriving data. However, if we reprocess the same uh, date folder over and over again to handle that late arriving data, we'll need to somehow add support for data mutability. And so um, the last one is stream processing over data lake, which is a bit unique because uh, it's sort of similar to batch processing in the sense it takes the same, uh, the same files from your data lake. However, uh, it doesn't read the entire folder by date or by partition. It actually reads all the new files that were uh, added to your data lake since the last execution. And this can be done in either batch or streaming. And then it processes them and writes them, uh, writes the, aggregate, the aggregated data to the uh, appropriate location in your data lake. And so, Similarly to batch processing, it can also reduce the operational cost, similar to how I mentioned earlier, by consuming read-optimized data and launching transient uh, batch job cluster. But it also uh, allows you to handle late arriving data, because remember, read only the new files that were added to your data lake, rather than reading entire folders or entire partitions. However, back then, uh, there was no support for reading files in a streaming fashion and also no built-in uh, support for data mutability. And so to sort of recap those three methods, uh, the stream processing into a data lake uh, was uh, uh, increasing your operational cost and the burden on source systems. It was able to handle late arriving data, but there was no support for data mutability. Batch processing was able to reduce the operational cost and reduce the burden from, of source systems, uh, but there was no support for late arriving data, no support for data mutability. And finally, stream processing uh, over a data lake brought uh, the benefits of reduced operational cost and reduced burden on source systems, as well as handling late arriving data, but uh, we had to handle these two challenges of supporting data mutability and supporting uh, uh, reading files in a streaming fashion. And so stream processing over a data lake seems like the best approach or the one with the most benefits, but we still needed to mitigate those gaps. And so at Nielsen Marketing Cloud, what we did in, uh, in order to mitigate some of them is to combine our data lake on cloud storage, which was S3, with Kafka and Spark. And the way it worked is we had uh, one Spark stateless application per Kafka topic reading the raw data and writing the files uh, almost without changing uh, too much of the data into our data lake. And then we had it uh, in folders such as raw dash, the name of the topic in Kafka, and then partitioned by date. But it didn't only wrote the raw data, it also wrote the file names to designated topics in Kafka, and each event uh, essentially contained the name of a file. And so if we wanted to consume the data by those uh, uh, Spark, Batch, or Stream uh, uh, consumers, 
we first read the file names from Kafka, and we were able to read only the new files because we uh, relied on Kafka's offsets mechanism, which ensured we are not reading all the files, only the ones that were added since the last execution. And then uh, the application could just read the files that we had the names now uh, and process them and write it to the appropriate destination, be it S3 or database, etc. That actually allowed us to reduce the cost by 80% by moving from 24-7 Spark streaming job clusters to transient Spark batch clusters. It also uh, meant that we uh, no longer put the additional burden on Kafka brokers, which was mostly I.O. Uh, on the Kafka disk, because we only had one consumer per Kafka topic, that Spark stateless streaming application that wrote the raw data to our data lake, and then all other consumers could consume the data directly from S3. Uh, and lastly, as I mentioned, uh, built-in handling of uh, later arriving events, because once we switched to reading only new files and not by folder, it meant that we no longer uh, missed any later having events or later having data. However, everything comes with a price, and it took us a small team and a few months of development to build this proprietary solution. So uh, fast forward to 2022, a lot have changed, and with the rise of tools like Delta Lake and features such as Autoloader, this becomes so much easier. So, if we talk about autoloader, it's a proprietary feature by Databricks that allows you to incrementally and efficiently process uh, new data files as they arrive to your uh, data lake storage. And it supports multiple file formats by providing a structured streaming source that's called cloud files. And uh, if you think about it, it's, it has more benefits as opposed to the sort of uh, vanilla Spark um, file stream source because it brings scalability performance schema inf uh, inference and uh, evolution, and uh, it can decrease your costs. And finally, it enables you as the developer to incrementally write the data to any supported sync. Now, it can uh, work in uh, one of two modes. The first mode is sort of the more naive mode, which is directory listing. So if you think about it, what it does, it just lists the input directory uh, to uh, identify new files. However, it does so in an optimized manner in order to reduce the number of API calls to your uh, cloud storage, uh, such as S3. The more, uh, let's say, uh, advanced or the more performant option is file notification. And so many cloud uh, storages, just, such as S3, whenever a new file is uploaded to a bucket, uh, they can emit uh, an event that's called object created. And so Autoloader can automatically set up notification services and queuing services to subscribe to those uh, file uh, created events and just read those uh, messages from the queue, and it doesn't have to list the files. Now, you've all heard the keynote uh, from uh, Michael Armbrist this morning about uh, Delta Lake, so it is a fully open source storage framework, uh, as it was announced this morning. It brings reliability to your Data Lake, such as ACID transactions and support for data mutability. It allows you to do time travel, which means you can query all the versions of your tables and a lot of other benefits. Not only that, but uh, it's an open source format, which means it uses, under the hood, it uses version parquet uh, files to store the data, but it also stores transaction log files in order to keep track of all the commits or all the changes that were made to the tables. And finally, it has a large ecosystem that keeps expanding. So, you know, it uh, integrates well with compute engines, not only Spark, but also uh, Presto, Fling, Trino, and Hive, and there are a few others, such as LakeFS that were mentioned uh, earlier in the keynote uh, today, and also uh, it provides APIs for uh, many of the uh, common program languages. So we've seen that Delta Lake brings support for data mutability on top of your data lake, which was one of the challenges that Ophi mentioned. And Autoloader allows you to read files in a streaming fashion in just a few lines of code. And so uh, let's now time travel forward to 2022 and see how Nexar leverages these tools to address the challenges that Ophi described earlier. Thank you, Itai, for a great uh, overview. Um, okay, so as a reminder of the challenge uh, we talked about earlier, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of signal files every day stored as ORC format with sizes of less than 250 kilobytes that we want to run analytical queries on, uh, which we've seen is super inefficient. So we want to transform this uh, into a read-optimized data. So this is an actual 
a screenshot from uh, one of the partitions we have on S3. Uh, you can see the number, uh, the, the, the enormous uh, number of, of, of files there. Um, so uh, we've built a reusable mechanism uh, to automatically and reliably compact these small files, uh, which is called Delta Compactor. Uh, Delta Compactor picks up any new ORC file um, created in a predefined S3 prefix uh, by uh, listening to an S3 object created messages um, that are automatically published to an SQSQ. As Itai showed earlier, uh, we're using uh, the autoloader. Uh, the Delta Compactor then repartitions the data and stores it in a Delta table which automatically compact and optimizes the data uh, for efficient read. We are running this setup continuously uh, in a small cluster because we care about end to end latency, uh, but it can also run in, uh, periodically in bigger batches. So here is a code snippet of how we initialize the autoloader when it's used by our own uh, Delta compactor. Uh, so autoloader pro uh, provides a structured streaming source called cloud, uh, cloud files, as Itai mentioned before. Uh, uh, we, we use uh, um, uh, use notification setting, uh, uh, which enables streaming data of new files using S3 object created event. Uh, we disable include existing files because we don't want autoloader to scan billions of, of files and ingest them upon startup. Um, here we set uh, the source file format, uh, or C in our case, uh, but Autoloader supports many file formats. Um, here we set the maximum number of files per trigger and maximum bytes uh, that Autoloader will attempt to read in every uh, trigger to make sure that uh, our cluster has enough resources like RAM to handle the loaded data. And here we set the SQSQ URL, uh, which uh, uh, object created events uh, are being published to and Autoloader consumes from. And here we specify the source file schema. Um, Autoloader can infer the schema of some file formats, like uh, Parquet, uh, but in, in, it still cannot infer the schema of ORC files. So we have to provide uh, the schema explicitly. Uh, and finally, here we set up the sync, uh, which is a delta table, uh, um, uh, uh, which we only append uh, data to it, and we configure it with auto compaction uh, to, to allow uh, auto optimization and compaction. Uh, so to summarize, uh, combining Delta Lake's uh, auto compaction and optimization um, with Databricks uh, auto loader um, has been proven to be reliable, uh, simple, and yet cost-effective uh, solution to incrementally and efficiently process data over our Data Lake. Uh, we were able to build uh, a read-efficient data store from hundreds of thousands of files that are uh, less than 250 kilobytes to only a few hundreds of files that are bigger than 100 megabytes. Uh, so this is the outcome only 600 files. And uh, so we, we've seen a simple uh, append-only data pipeline, uh, and now I think it's, it's, uh, it's time to walk through a more complex pipeline where we were able to significantly reduce cost while maintaining a mutable uh, large-scale data store. So some of our customers uh, are not interested in only fresh and recent images. They require a constant, uh, predictable, and consistent view of the roads. Uh, even if the images uh, that they can uh, retrieve were captured months or even uh, years ago. So we started building and maintaining our constant coverage index. Uh, the basic approach behind it is to always keep the best N images for a spatial area. Uh, the definition of what N is and the definition of what is best can be defined on a per product basis. Um, in Nexa, we use uh, Uber's H3 grid system to partition the world into hexagons. So the special area, which we call Hexag, is a combination of H3 Hexagon and an open source, uh, open street map uh, uh, road segment. Uh, the constant coverage index requires uh, keeping an account of the coverage, where uh, for each Hexag, uh, we're maintaining a stack of frames metadata, which is limited by a predefined cap. Once the stack is filled up, it will rotate and frames that are considered better will replace existing frames within uh, the hexag. Better is defined by a scoring function that uh, considers image quality, uh, time of day, we prefer daylight images, and freshness of the frame. So this is our initial design for building and maintaining the constant coverage index. Uh, you can see on the left, um, metadata of frames with detections are pushed uh, to a Kafka topic. And then we have uh, Java consumers uh, running on Kubernetes that decide if the new offered frames are better than the ones uh, already stored in CLADB, which is our serving store, but also uh, functions here as the source of truth 
uh, for the constant coverage index. If we decide to add uh, a frame or bump out an existing frame, a change message is pushed to Kafka to be quickly persisted in S3 as ORC files. Then the spatial indexer uh, utilizes autoloader to read only new files and update the delta table which we use uh, to kind of back up the constant coverage index. So this solution provides uh, low latency updates, uh, less than uh, one millisecond, uh, um, uh, which we uh, uh, thankfully, uh, uh, thanks to Scylla, and it's, it's relatively straightforward. The downside is that it forces uh, the serving store to grow linearly as the constant coverage index storage grows, and uh, write throughput is bounded to the serving store's capacity. Um, in addition, uh, having this uh, split brain of updating Scylla and then uh, uh, updating uh, the delta table um, uh, later makes it uh, very hard uh, to debug issues. So um, we, uh, we, we wanted to improve the design, especially to reduce the, the expected cost. Uh, we didn't want to keep uh, 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 the full constant coverage index in Scylla, which uh, turned out to be super expensive. Uh, so here is the, the final uh, version uh, uh, we've built. So again, we have uh, metadata of frames with detections uh, that are pushed to a Kafka topic, and we persist them as quickly as possible to S3 as ORC files. Then the special indexer utilizes uh, autoloader to read only new files, um, uh, uses Delta Lake's data mutability features uh, to update uh, a Delta table uh, with frames that are better. Um, we also use uh, change data feed uh, to later send all uh, constant coverage index changes to the serving store. Uh, and by the way, this setup is scheduled periodically uh, rather than running 24-7. Uh, so the new solution reduced the potential cost by hundreds of thousands of dollars if we were using Scylla to store the full constant coverage index. In addition, the write throughput is bounded to the um, uh, serving store updater job. Uh, this solution is still simple, but there is a bit of complexity added with the uh, change data feed. Um, and it's a lot easier to debug issues now. Cool. So we all have uh, scars or burns from keeping our data lake optimized, but you don't re uh, need to reinvent the wheel. You can just leverage existing tools and practices such as Delta Lake as a read-optimized format that also supports data mutability in ACID transactions. And we encourage you to use stream processing over your Delta Lake because it can reduce your operational costs. And if you uh, use autoloader, it can also reduce the uh, development efforts. Uh, just before we wrap things up, a few things we care about. So Women in Big Data is a worldwide program that aims to inspire, connect, go, and champion the success of women in the big data analytics field. There are over 40 chapters worldwide, and everyone can join regardless of gender. So we encourage you to find a chapter near you using this Women in Big Data website. There's also a special Women in Data and AI meetup uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, at 11.30 uh, a.m. at the Intercontinental. Um, there's, uh, there are a few uh, interesting talks. Uh, and uh, today, at 2.50 p.m., TD and Danny Lee will do a Delta Lake 2.0 overview that's bound to be very interesting. And you can also uh, find a few uh, other resources that we thought you might uh, found useful for you. That's it for us. We really appreciate your participation, and we'll be taking questions now. Feel free to reach out to both Sophia and myself over Twitter and LinkedIn, and please don't forget to rate our session on the platforms, uh, on the Summit platform. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.